I am thrilled to be part of this caucus on, dis on disability issues um, with the council and, dis and the disabled. Uh, I want to thank everyone that's on this call. Uh, it is truly a bipartisan effort. Republicans, Democrats, and we all do care about the special needs, the special needs community sometimes, but their issues get forgotten or, bit, or get put on the back burner. What we were doing here in New Jersey Transit. We talked about buses. We talked about trains. But we didn't talk about our transit until we started raising the issue. So more like, you can't forget these people. So as we're developing legislation that is going to have an impact on everyone in the state, we have to make sure that people with disabilities, that their views are put into the mix also. So having this caucus together, and I said this before, I'm, I'm grateful Tom Kane and I worked on many issues in the Senate. And the legislators on this call, I know all have a, have a great level of care and compassion. And, and uh, this is something we should have been done a long time ago. And I'm glad we're, we're finally here, and that we're going to ensure that people with disabilities' voices are heard, as we just recently did with NJ Transit. So for the, for the paratransit contract, where we actually worked with the ARC, and that's some really good legislation done. So with that, thank you for having me, and, and uh, I know the majority leaders up next, Louis Greenwald. Everyone, thank you. I, I'm very honored to have been asked to be one of the family members of this caucus. Uh, I've learned so much from my friends, uh, like Steve Sweeney, and my friends who have family members who've struggled with disabilities, and I've been inspired by their love and passion, but I've also been touched by their struggles. And... As I chaired the budget committee uh, for a little over 10 years, during that cycle, you know, every year we faced the challenges with the New Jersey budget. We would hear the cause, the cause and the need for home health care aids, for uh, funding for education, questions around how we deinstitutionalize people and help them uh, return into the community. Uh, the impact on health care and the disparity of uh, residents with disabilities and how it might affect their health care and see them with a higher level of health costs and needs that maybe go unhidden or unnoticed until the time of the budget. And it was impressed upon me that in a state of 9 million people, 2.2 million New Jersey residents suffer from some form of disability or not. And I think what excites me about this caucus is one, serving with my friends, but also in a bipartisan fashion to be able to build towards the budget process and understand how public policy that we do not only, not only impacts the resident, but also impacts their families. And build maybe towards a budget process so that when we hit budget season, we're not reacting to the needs of the community, but more importantly, we're building on an annual basis public policy that really has an ongoing impact in a positive way uh, for these 2.2 million residents of one degree or another that fight a disability, make their lives easier, make their families easier, help them to be productive members of society, which is what they desire and what their families desire through employment, through access to health care, education to support them and their employment needs, and ultimately to improve their quality of life. So I'm very honored to be on this uh, on the Zoom call. I'm very honored to be one of the founding members of the caucus. I truly cherish uh, that you would have thought of us this way. And I'm excited to work with my colleagues. And thank you all for having me. Thank you, Senate President Sweet and Assembly Majority Leader Greenwald. Your leadership on disability issues is truly remarkable. My name is Mercedes Switowski. As Executive Director of the New Jersey Council on Developmental Disabilities and parent of a daughter with disabilities, and, um, and on behalf of the entire New Jersey Council on Developmental Disabilities and its chairperson, Paul Blaustein, we could not be prouder and more thankful for the fierce leaders in our great state and the voices of people with disabilities with lived experiences as they advocate in ways that will assist them in living full lives as members of their community. Launching the New Jersey Legislative Disability Caucus today is truly a landmark event that turns a concept into reality. New Jersey is now one of eight other states across the country who have some form of a legislative disability caucus. 
I'm going to venture to say that the New Jersey Legislative Disability Caucus will be the strongest, wisest, fairest in representing one in four New Jerseyans who identify with having some type of disability. Issues of employment, transportation, housing, education from early intervention to transition after age 21, access to health care and quality supportive services and a quality workforce are just a few of the top areas that are challenging people with disabilities and their families and others who support them. However, when a system is designed to include all people, regardless of disability, the system can only be stronger and fairer. NJCD is proud to join with a core group of outstanding disability organizations in spearheading the caucus, and we must acknowledge these groups now. Autism New Jersey, Brain Injury Alliance of New Jersey, Disability Rights New Jersey, New Jersey Association of Mental Health and Addiction Agencies, New Jersey State Independent Living Council, Ombudsman for Individuals with Intellectual or Developmental Disabilities and Their Families, SPAN Parent Advocacy Network, Supportive Housing Association of New Jersey, the Alliance for the Betterment of Citizens with Disabilities, the ARC of New Jersey, the Bog Center of Developmental Disabilities at Robert Wood Johnson Medical School, and the New Jersey Association of Community Providers. 29 legislative leaders in our state immediately stood out when called to action in becoming founding members of this caucus. Thank you again, Senate President Sweeney, for remaining a champion for people with disabilities in your role as chair of the New Jersey Disability Caucus. Thank you to Senator Buco, Senator Corrado, Senator Deegan, Senator Gopal, Senate Republican Leader Kane, Senator Madden, Senator O'Scanlan, Senator Ruiz, Senator Singleton, and Senator Vitali. Thank you to members of the Assembly, Assemblyman Benson, Assemblywoman Shaparo, Assemblyman Chavalati, Assemblyman Dancer, Assemblywoman Downey, Assemblywoman Dunn, Assemblyman Greenwald, Assemblyman Hoteling, Assemblywoman Veneri Huddle, Assemblywoman Lambert, Assemblywoman Lopez, Assemblywoman Munoz, Assemblywoman Murphy, Assemblywoman Shapisi, Assemblyman Telefero, Assemblywoman Tim Blake, Assemblyman Varelli, and Assemblyman Zwicker. Your commitment to the caucus underscores your promise to all citizens in our state. We celebrate today because we know that including all New Jersey citizens in our communities, our actions and our purpose makes New Jersey stronger and fairer for everyone. It was very challenging today to limit the number of willing speakers at this kickoff event, but we know that the work in the years ahead will include all your voices, contributions and recommendations as we identify and remove barriers and advance public policies that include people with disabilities. So please join me in welcoming the first set of advocate speakers, Kevin Nunez, Donald Campbell, and Brian Kulas. Uh, good afternoon. Today is a historic day for people at least in New Jersey, not only for people with disabilities, but across the entire state of New Jersey. This disability caucus allows people and families to be proactive with their legislators instead of reactive. This will give New Jersey a great opportunity to step forward on the national level. One of the ways we can do this is by creating opportunities and chances for equal and competitive employment for people and families affected by disabilities. It has been proven that when someone has equal competitive fulfilling work, they're happier and more productive members of society. In this COVID-19 world, 
we all have to come together to rebuild this fractured economy. We have a chance here to create positive and great system change. The question is, are we in New Jersey up for the challenge? It is no coincidence that this year marks the 30th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. This, we are at a precipice to bring forth great change with employment and other such activities. So thank you, Senator Sweeney and other members of the legislature for giving our families and people with disabilities a voice when it comes to talking with our elected officials. Thank you all for your time and have a great day. On to the next speaker. Hello, my name is Donald Campbell. I am with the Atlantic Center for Independent Living. Uh, Center for Independent Living exists statewide and we are resource support and advocacy centers for people with disabilities at no cost, no matter what the age or where they are in life. Uh, we provide them a safe place where they can learn things like life skills and have, and find resources so they can live as independently as they choose. I am absolutely honored to be here. I think the caucus is a huge step forward for people with disabilities in New Jersey, and it's just so important to really highlight the message of this caucus, which is that all issues are disability issues, whether they whether it's housing, transportation, employment, education, healthcare, criminal justice. Uh, we, we have learned throughout this pandemic that the more we include people with disabilities, the better we are as a state and as a community. It was people with disabilities that have been at the forefront of fighting for quality healthcare, of fighting for things like flexible work environments, things that we're taking advantage of right now. So I would just implore uh, the caucus to keep focused on its mission, which is to make sure that every single issue that goes before the state house is seen through a disability lens, because all issues, no matter what it is, it's not just about the curve cuts on the sidewalk, which are awesome and we love. It's about all the issues that focus on that affect everybody. And the more we include people with disabilities, the more our state will thrive and succeed. Thank you so much for having me. And I look forward to hearing from the other speakers. Everyone, uh, my name is Brian Kulas. And uh, I'm I'm from the Sport Housing Association, which is an or a networking organization that helps uh, many organizations be able to provide information, share information, and also the Supporting Housing Association uh, works with our legislators to uh, help, you know, organize legislation to help people with disabilities. Uh, I have I have a mental health disability, three uh, schizoaffective, uh, OCD, and seasonal affective disorder. And basically, uh, I'm here to talk about housing today because housing has made all the indifference in my entire life. Uh, I'm speaking today from my apartment, which is a subsidy which I originally received from the New Jersey Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services. This helped me not be homeless any longer. It helped me from not being lost and having this rental subsidy today has changed my life. I was able to get started going back to school, make lifestyle changes. I Sometimes I look at myself in the mirror and I really don't even recognize who I am, but that's a great feeling because it all began with um, affordable housing and that becomes with rental subsidies. Communities get stronger. They get better. Uh, moving into my new apartment gave me the ability and the opportunity to even become family with my neighbors. And having that experience, being able to say hello to my neighbors all the time and get feedback from them has really been tremendous. Housing makes all the difference in the world. And uh, it's great to know that our legislators in Trenton are uh, working on this and putting this in the forefront. Um, it is a tremendous opportunity. I look forward to working with everybody and uh, just thank you for your time. Thank you, gentlemen, for sharing your important messages and your stories with us today. Please allow me to now introduce Senator Kane, Assemblyman Murphy, 
Sarah Buko, and Assemblyman Benson. I'm excited to join with the incredible agencies and organizations who are on this call today, as well as with my colleagues in the Senate and the General Assembly for the formation of the New Jersey Legislative Disability Caucus. I believe this is a great day, not just for the disability community, but for all of New Jersey. What we're announcing today demonstrates a clear commitment from the legislature to work together in a bipartisan manner. And there has been no greater leader on issues of importance to this community than Steve Sweeney has been in his entire tenure in the, in the legislature. It's an honor to have drawn him in the, in the past as well as in the future on so many and in solving so many issues affecting uh, this community. I look forward to working together with him and partnering with him in this regard going forward to ensure that all of our state policies are more thoughtful, are more inclusive and supportive of the needs of individuals with disabilities and their families. A few years ago, when we worked together to stop Return Home New Jersey, we realized just how effective we could be when we joined forces. And frankly, I think that most of us would agree that announcing what we are announcing today long overdue. The current public health emergency has really driven home the desperate need for this collaborative effort. Many of the individuals and families found themselves suddenly cut off from critical resources, services, and care during the COVID lockdowns, and with little guidance or support from the state. Many of our group homes and other residential facilities found themselves lacking sufficient staff and sufficient resources, again, with little insight and, and guidance from the state. Our families work together to make sure that the loved ones were safe. We've also heard concerns that triage policies at hospitals during this pandemic result in people with disabilities being denied access to life saving treatment for care. And that's something we should not tolerate and we need to fix. And it's also clear that we need to expand the role of the Adams women to serve the people with all types of disabilities. And those are just a few of the issues that we've been over the last couple of months. We know there are many other long standing concerns that still need to be addressed. And so while we have incredibly important work ahead of us, I'm fine, I'm, I'm thrilled that this caucus exists and the partnership exists within Trenton and non Trenton to make sure that we have the strong advocacy necessary to get these important changes signed into law going forward. I look forward to working with all of you. Thank you. I want to echo a lot of what my colleagues are saying and my uh, community partners here on this call today. It's such an honor to be part of this historic caucus um, to do a lot of good work we can do, and not only as a legislator, but also as a partner and partnerships are being formed. I also would like to say thank you to Senator Sweeney and the Majority Leader Lou Greenwald. Both of you throughout the years have definitely shown signs and have shown everything that we need to know about how to be voices in Trenton for our, our folks who are um, coming to meet with us on disabilities. To echo my friend Kevin Nunes, uh, we have worked together on several pieces of legislation uh, since I got elected a few years ago. And it cannot be even more of a proud moment for myself to say, to call him my friend, my constituent, but more, more importantly, a partner in this. And as we start talking about employment and we start talking about the value of having folks with disabilities work with us and actually contribute to the way we see things is such a pleasure that um, I, I cannot even express more heartily. This year is a year of historic event. We have been through everything this year that we could think of. We're closing down 2020 in a year that has made a lot of difference to many people's lives. We talk about equality. We talk about pandemic. We talk about health. We've talked about social justice. We've talked about vaccine importance. So as we move forward with this caucus, we cannot forget our folks who are there to contribute the same things that we are searching for, and that is equality. They need to be put on the same playing field that we are. They have families to support. They want to live independently. They don't take handouts, and they want to make sure that they are an equal partner in everything we do in the legislature. And they want their voices to be heard, just like each and every one of us does. With that, I have to say thank you, and it's such a whole experience to be able to be part of this caucus, and it's great to know that the friends that I have dealt with for the last few years are going to continue being partners with me in many aspects of legislation. 
Thank you so very much and have a great day. I'd like to uh, thank you for the opportunity to say a few words today and to my colleagues and all of the organizations on the wall, thank you for being here as well. Uh, this is certainly a pivotal day for New Jersey's developed disability community and the launch of this influential caucus will help improve living conditions and the daily lives uh, of some of our most vulnerable citizens. I want to thank the Senate President uh, for his vision in bringing this group together uh, with our common goals on behalf of those who face a gauntlet of obstacles most of us can only imagine. Issues like housing, health care, education, employment, transportation, and many others. The COVID crisis has uh, certainly made those issues even more uh, harder to, to overcome in these trying times. And I am sure that this caucus will work diligently to make sure uh, that those issues are addressed. As someone who grew up in a family with a family member with a de developmental disability, uh, I understand firsthand how hard it is, uh, not only for uh, the disabled, but for the family members uh, and how they struggle to make sure that their voice is heard and how they worry what the future will bring uh, for their loved ones. So um, I look forward to working with this caucus. I think as the Senate president said, this is not a Republican or Democrat issue. Um, this is a, a human issue that all of us uh, understand and all of us want to work to make sure that those that suffer with disability make sure they have uh, what they need to survive. And Kevin, yes, to answer your question, I do think my colleagues and I on this call are up for the challenge and we look forward uh, to doing great things in the future. I just wanted to, again, uh, thank Senator Bucco and my colleagues um, and bring voice as transportation chair um, to mention how important these issues are. We heard about housing, we heard about health care and other access. Transportation access is key too. We, I'm proud uh, as transportation to work with my colleagues and to join this caucus so that we have um, a, a fight for transportation equity. We know that disability doesn't take a day off. Disability doesn't take a holiday. So transportation equity and equity in all that we do is so important day in and day out in our policies. It has to be baked in. Because we know tearing down barriers and creating accommodations is not about uh, something that's nice to have. This is about making sure that we honor the civil rights of all of New Jersey's residents with disabilities. So I'm glad that this informal working that we've been doing for years, and the Senate President mentioned our work uh, that he uh, led to raise up paratransit and tie it together with our community providers to really deliver better equity and transportation, more options, that we do this now in a formal manner with this caucus. And I'm proud to be a, a part of that with my colleagues. And I know we're going to continue to do great things uh, under that banner uh, in the rest of the session and the years to come. So again, thank you so much to the caucus. And I want to say a special thanks to the self-advocates for which out their voice being heard has led to so many good pieces of legislation that allows us to do the work of the people. Thank you so much. Thank you for your commitment and the encouraging remarks of our the members of our legislature. Um, and now I'm pleased to present four additional advocates Scott Pullman, Heather Sims, Sarah Aziz, and Neng Wong. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Scott Pullman. I'm a traumatic brain injury survivor of three plus years, currently residing in Somerset County, specifically in the town of Somerville. I'm speaking today on behalf of the Council for the Head Injury Community, which is a part of the Brain Injury Alliance of New Jersey on the whole. Um, I'm honored to be here. It's a little bit surreal, but um, I wanted to uh, share a little bit of my personal story and relate to relate to what's happening right now across society, um, expanding, giving a little bit of a personal touch of what Senator Keene had uh, alluded to. So like everybody else, to one extent or another, I've struggled to adjust to the astonishing changes over the past few months, almost a year now, actually, since the uh, pandemic and subsequent measures have uh, become part of our regular lives. However, I will say I've also been extremely fortunate in that the acute phase of my brain injury had already been well behind me by the time all of this began. 
the early excuse me, the early portion of my recovery was very difficult psychologically on me. And had the uh, current measures overlapped within the struggle with the struggles I had to face at the time, I literally don't know how I would have been able to survive because for the 18 months after my concussion, I struggled with uh, suicidal thoughts, which is not something I had a problem prior to my brain injury. We hear about that with, uh, with football players and, and athletes. And, um, you know, I, I was I was fortunate, though, very fortunate to overcome this with the help of professionals and other survivors and specifically um, with lots of programs provided in New Jersey, such as support groups, day programs, therapy, yoga and medication designed for brain injury survivors. So in a nutshell, it was interaction with other people, personal interaction that helped keep you going. I don't tell this story looking for pity. I tell this story because I know there are people right now who are struggling with these very challenges, but don't have the same, don't have access to the same resources that I had access to because nearly everything that was a big part of my life early on and, and actually up until the, uh, the pandemic uh, lockdown started, all those activities have either become Zoom meetings or just canceled together. We hear about struggles of, with youth. We hear about the struggles of um, online education that our youth are currently going through. I have a, a niece and a nephew. Um, actually, my niece also has a brain injury, which is another story. But um, they're, they're currently doing online education now, and, and I see the struggles they have. I can assure you that similar types of struggles are being experienced throughout the brain injury community at large, as I'm speaking right now. So it is my hope that working with this committee, committee, we can help reach common sense solutions to help other struggling brain injury survivors get the kind of help that I was fortunate to receive when I needed it most. And again, I'm, I'm very honored here to, to bring this subject up, and I thank you all for your time. Hi, my name is Heather Sims. I'm the Deputy Director of Peer Advocacy and Community Initi Initiatives collaborative support programs in New Jersey, which is the pure and statewide behavioral health agency. I currently live in Burlington County. I welcome this opportunity to be able to speak directly with members of the legislature. I'm glad to be with you today and thank the caucus for hearing our voices. I also happen to be a person with lived experience of mental health and have been homeless in the past. I was fortunate enough to have had the opportunity to benefit from supported housing services and mental health services. I also now work with the same peer-led agency that helped me in my path to recovery and also being an active member of my community. As I've grown in my recovery, I now advocate for others and share their voices. This experience has driven my passion for assisting others with access to safe, decent, affordable housing, as well as opportunities for employment and programs that support health safety, and, a qual and quality life of others. I hope to share how these programs and public policies support community inclusion for all with a disability. These programs provide individuals with disabilities an opportunity to grow and live lives in their choice in community. I wanted to thank all the legislators for supporting the caucus and Senator Sweeney for your leadership I look forward to working with you and this caucus in the future, hearing our voices. Thank you. Hello, I'm Sarah Aziz. I'm a member of the New Jersey Council on Development to Disabilities, and I live in Monroe Township. I'm so glad to have this opportunity to speak directly with our state legislators, their staff, and other members of the special needs community. I'm excited about the creation of the new disability caucus in our state legislature, and I hope that it truly gives special needs families a real voice in our state government. I'm the mother of a 12-year-old child with autism. The recent school closures resulting from the coronavirus pandemic have been hard on all families, especially those with children with disabilities. There are very young children with disabilities that normally get screened for early intervention services that have not been screened due to the pandemic. Our children require highly specialized in-person instruction and therapies that are difficult to replicate in, in a remote learning environment. Many of our children have suffered over a year's worth of regression over the past eight months, and it will be difficult for them to catch up, especially because cases of COVID-19 are rising and schools that have recently reopened may be forced to close again soon. Currently under state law, many children with disabilities can remain in our public schools until the age of 21. Given that so many of our students have suffered such great regression over the past eight months, I really think that our state should consider changing this law and allowing our students to remain in the public schools 
past the age of 21 to compensate them for this huge loss in learning. Additionally, I would urge our state legislature, le legislators to increase school state aid for all districts, including my own of Monroe Township, to allow school districts to fully compensate um, their students um, by providing them additional services uh, when schools fully reopen. I also ask our, urge our legislators to provide special needs families with the additional supports they need during these, these, these critical times. I want to thank all of our legislators in, for supporting this caucus, especially Senator Sweeney and my own Assemblyman Dan Benson for their leadership and for seeing me as an informed and dedicated advocate. Thank you so much for your time. Hi, I am Nang Wong a member of the Region 5 Family Support Planning Council. I live in Middlesex County. I am the mother of an 18-year-old son with severe autism. I'm grateful for a chance to speak with members of the legislature and their staff. I'm glad to be with you today and hope that this disability caucus will allow me to have a voice at the table for those who cannot speak for themselves. Families talk about the transition from school to adult services as falling off the cliff. When youths with disabilities finish school, all previous educational entitlement supports disappear. Families need to be guided through the maze of adult services to understand and prepare their children for the challenges and opportunities ahead. This process takes time and resources, and all the pieces should be in place before students exit the school system. It is critical that they get help they need to be successful in the adult world. Thank you to all the legislators for supporting the Disability Caucus, especially Senator Sweeney for your leadership. Thank you for your time. Next, please help me welcome Senator Gopal, Assemblywoman Venary Huddle, Assemblywoman Lampett, and Assemblywoman Downey. Thank you, uh, ladies, and thank you for everyone for, for being here and all the advocates. Special thanks to Senate President for his, uh, you know, how passionate he's been on this issue. He's been to my district to visit many of the facilities here. Uh, and my friend Solomon Greenwald, always the best dressed person on every, every Zoom. Uh, I think he jumped off, but uh, it's good to see everybody, the advocates um, and uh, uh, all of the legislators uh, who have been so passionate about this. Um, I, I always like to talk about a few constituents and I'll just mention them real quickly, who I think about. Anna Landry, who we worked together over the last three years, a college student lives in Monmouth County. I went to Georgetown, had incredible challenges with the Department of Human Services with their archaic Medicaid rules. And together, because of her input and advocacy, we put uh, incredible pieces of legislation uh, as, well as, um, as well as regulations put into place. Dr. Paul Stewart Wachanski, a constituent of mine in Freehold, who uh, has spent over 40 years educating youth parents and educators to disprove stereotypes they're so often displayed with disabilities. Um, Anita Clavering, a constituent of mine in Long Branch, who reached out wanting to get involved on the issue of supporting those with disabilities, but also beat access, worked up and down the county through organizations like Motions, and the Alliance of the Betterments of Citizens with Disabilities, Disability Rights in New Jersey, and many other groups, in making sure that every beach in Monmouth County, from Long Branch to Union Beach, had beach access and it was fascinating to see these archaic rules and how together we changed them. Uh, the issue of mental health is always important. Uh, I've always spoken about how I've struggled with depression for years. It's a really important issue to me and that is something I know that Assemblywoman Hub and many others have championed, uh, the Senate President, that we need to make sure that those with disabilities, the mental health challenges that they face, that collectively it's not on the back burner and I know that uh, with this caucus in the months and years ahead, there are going to be so many issues that we can make sure that those who are the most vulnerable here in New Jersey are not left behind. So this is an exciting day. It's a great day. And uh, I want to thank you for including me in this. Thank you. Uh, nice to see you, Vin. Um, 
It's nice to see everybody. And I'm also proud to be on um, the, this new founding uh, committee, the New Jersey Legislative Disability Caucus. Um, I see so many familiar faces today. Uh, I've met many of you as my time as chair of the human services in the assembly. And throughout my time in the legislature, I've worked hand in hand with many of you uh, to craft legislation that would improve access and treatment for the disability community. As a matter of fact, one of my first pieces of legislation that was signed into law, Senator Sweeney, um, I'm reminded of the time, it was my first bill actually, I came down to South Jersey and um, the governor removed or signed out bill removing the archaic language, um, the names including retarded from um, from the books. I remember that like yesterday. I think that was, I think it was like 2006. Um, so we've done incredible work together. And despite all of the work that has been done, COVID-19 has showed us how much more work is left to do. And together we have to continue to work with all of you. Um, we've heard about many of the services and issues that are needed for everyone today, but there's no question that one of those pressing issues facing the disability community is access to mental health services. And COVID-19, as you heard, and as we all know, has taken a toll on everyone's mental health. However, access for the disability community can look very different and pose many different obstacles than what the non-disabled community experiences. COVID-19 has left all of us feeling isolated and lonely. However, for individuals with disabilities living in group homes, that isolation has been all the more extreme. And so we must continue to work together to find new solutions for the disability community. Currently, I'm working with many of my colleagues on this Zoom today um, to help ISO or to help um, during emergencies when visitation may be restricted. Uh, that we can prevent that isolation in those in those scenarios. So I look forward to working with the caucus to get valuable feedback on this and future policies. And I think that's why the establishment of the Legislative Disability Caucus is so critical. Now more than ever, we must center the voices of you, the disability community. By establishing this forum to bring these issues to the forefront, we can definitely ensure that the policies under consideration in the legislature keep in mind the diverse experiences and needs of the disability community. So again, I'm proud to be part of this and I'm happy to be working with each and every one of you. And it's nice to see everyone on Zoom, whether we're well-dressed or not. Have a great day and we'll continue our, our talks. Hello, everybody. I am Assemblywoman Pam Lampett. And I am uh, the chair of the Education Committee, and I am honored and, and privileged to be part of this groundbreaking caucus. Um, and it's really great to see everybody. Uh, you know, it's been, <laughs> it's been a wild, uh, how many months now? Eight, nine months now. And uh, it uh, truly has challenged each and every one of us. Um, but it's really great to see a lot of familiar faces and... Um, I'm just moved by everybody's stories. Uh, and, you know, I think that many times we legislate through our lives um, and the lives of the people who are around us. Um, so let me just tell you a quick story and then I'll talk about education. Um, my niece was born premature and um, early on we didn't know what was really wrong. She did not get early intervention, and I'll talk about that later. She didn't get an early intervention. Uh, it wasn't until she was about four years old that she was diagnosed with, with cerebral palsy. It's crazy in this day and time that it took that long uh, for her to get diagnosed. I'm very proud of my children and my children's friends because they didn't let Amber just sit in the corner. No, that wasn't what they accepted. What they wanted was her to be able to participate in everything that they were doing. But Amber's legs didn't work the same way. Amber's mind didn't work the same way. Amber didn't voice the same way that my children could voice. My children just didn't accept it. They kept on working with her. 
And her parents, my sister and brother-in-law say today that Amber walks and speaks as well as she does because of the effort of my children and my children's friends. Now, many of us have those stories, um, but you know, now with the role and responsibility of being a legislator and being chair of education, um, I, I think about early intervention and the importance of it. It's not only important for able children, it's so, so important for the disabled child. So to determine early on whether or not, you know, the diagnosis of autism or ADHD or severe learning disability, comprehension disability, there's so many educational components. The earliest the intervention can happen, the better the result can, can be for children. And I see Kevin nodding for me. Um, really, it's that focus uh, that we need to give. Many people just dispel the idea that, you know, this is a toddler, this is an infant, you know, they don't need to, uh, they don't need to have that type of interaction. They need it more so. Uh, the development of the brain uh, in, the, in the early year, in the early months, in the early years uh, is vital to the success. And for a, for a child who may have uh, some disabilities, uh, to realize that uh, their potential could be that much greater. Uh, because of the efforts that we made. Um, education, education is, you know, equity, you know, all students is imperative. We need to remove barriers. Uh, I think I've heard this several times, but we do, we need to remove the barriers so that, uh, so that our children uh, can be successful. For the mother who spoke so eloquently about the impact of COVID, yeah, it was really uh, to think about our children who were who had disabilities who are now home uh, and trying to get resources that they needed to continue their development. Uh, so when we talk about learning loss or, or the loss of, of growth, uh, we need to really focus separately on our disabled community uh, because their learning loss is that much more um, a, much more uh, uh, glorified or, or elaborated or, or, or lifted up in terms of the, the ability their learning loss has really been impacted upon them and their families. Um, it is really the mission of this caucus that everything we do, whether or not it's transportation, whether or not it's education, whether or not it's, it's human services, or whether or not it's you know finance, insurance, and banking, we're constantly thinking constantly thinking about our disabled community. Uh, you know, the mother also brought up the idea that what, what happens at the age of 21. You know, I said that too. Bob Titus will tell you. I've been saying that for a while. Why do we think that, that children uh, are, uh, who are disabled are fully educated by the age of 21? Why? Who made that rule? We're legislators. We can change that rule. We need to fight we need to fight Washington, D.C. We need to get the message down there that this age range needs to change those who are disabled. We need to continue to support our disabled community, not sever our ties and our commitments at the age of 21. In the great words of my uh, good friend, um, Speaker Joe Roberts, who is really one of the best advocates, along with Senator Sweeney, uh, best advocates for the disabled community, he said, become an expert on something and do good. So I believe with this group of experts that you have culminated together, uh, we are all going to do amazing things. So I'm honored, privileged. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. I'm so proud to be here with all of these wonderful people. Thank you to Senate President Sweeney for being the chair of this amazing committee. This bipartisan disability caucus is incredible. Honestly, you were right. This is way overdue, Senator Sweeney. It should have been done a long time ago, and I'm so happy that we're all here to be a part of this. As chair of the Human Services Committee right now, I am so excited to be able to now work even more with the rest of my legislative colleagues here in the Senate and in the General Assembly. I know that we talk about like certain disabilities and we keep them separate. Now we realize more and more that really what was said, I think, by Donald Campbell, that all disability issues or everyone's issues or human issues 
But you know what? Even more important, every person with a disability is unique and their needs are unique. And we have to remember that. It's not one size fits all. This especially became clear during COVID. All of the issues everyone talked about, whether it be transportation, education, food, housing, all of those different issues, healthcare. But we really noticed it. I especially noticed it even more recently when I was working with the, our ombudsman for developmental intellectual disabilities, Paul Aronson, who's amazing. And I really commend him for all his hard work with him and one other person in his office. They're incredible. We will expand that office. That is my goal that I hope is all of our goal to make sure that includes all disabilities. And I think he's up to the challenge. Kevin, just like we're up to the challenge of handling the legislation, I believe he's up to the challenge to handle all of the disabilities. And we had a, an important hearing a few weeks ago on abuse and neglect in long-term care. Once again, it brought to my attention as well as to many people's attention. Everything that happens is not again limited to one group because we have intellectual dis disabilities, we have developmental disabilities, we have physical disabilities, we have multi disabilities, people who suffer from dual diagnosis, so they have mental health issues together with another disability, those who have multi with many, three or four. That's again why it's so hard to really have one size fits all. And that's why again, it's important to recognize they are self advocates like the ones who are here who are amazing people who can speak for themselves, and there are many others who cannot speak for themselves at all. And we have to worry and be concerned about them as well, our most vulnerable. And on top of that, we need to re remember to include the parents, to include the caregivers, the guardians, because they know best too, as well as the rest of these wonderful people, these organizations. So I wanna thank you all because coming together means everything. And I'm proud also to work with my two colleagues in District 11, Monmouth County, Senator Gopal, and also my partner, Assemblyman Eric Helling. We've always, always wanted to make sure that we were more inclusive and worked with that community. And we will work with all of you to make this a better place in New Jersey and more inclusive New Jersey for everyone. They're going to be at the table. The disability community should be there sitting with all of us. And now you are. So thank you so much. And God bless everyone. Be safe. And let's get going. We have, a lot of, we have a lot of work to do. Thank thank you all. We sure do have a lot of work to do, Assemblywoman Downey. Um, it's been a real honor to be part of today's launch of the Disability Caucus. Um, here's a few messages to help us close out the event and give you some next steps. Please mark your calendars for the 2021 Disability Caucus issue briefing sessions. It will all meet at noon on January 26th. April 27th, July 27th, and October 26th. January 26th issue briefing session will focus on COVID-19 and the disability community. As I thank all of the founding legislative leaders of the Disability Caucus, and especially those of you that got to speak today, um, those names will now appear on your screen. Please know that all members of the legislature are encouraged to sign on as Disability Caucus members. As I thank all supporting organizations who stand behind the Disability Caucus, please let us know if your organization would like to be added to the list of supporting organizations by contacting Gary Brown at NJCDD. His contact information is available on your screen. Today would not be possible without all of our incredible speakers and those of you listening. I'd like to thank Barbara Coppins and Steve Guslavik for remaining available to speak and many magic hands behind the scenes who pulled this event together, especially Bob Titus and Gary Brown at NJCDD and Association Business Solutions. Thank you all. Stay well and may today bring us together in ways that form a better tomorrow for everyone.